In the light of union frustration after the unsuccessful Peninsula campaign failed to take Richmond, and the Confederacy Seven Days campaign, which repelled the Union Army of the Potomac, the North's military powers that be surrendered something they would regret. The Strategic Initiative. This is the story of what Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia did with it. In a dramatic turnaround in the Eastern Theater, we returned to ground through which ran a stream that locals called Bull Run. This is the story of the Battle of Second Manassas. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there to show that history is indeed a story. In July of 1862, there was dissension and mistrust within the Union Army of the Potomac. A Massachusetts cavalry officer summed the situation by stating, We have been divided by our leaders. Only a month before, Major General George McClellan's army was only three or four miles outside of Richmond. Then, Robert E. Lee's Seven Days campaign hammered them back to the James River. Despite the fact that Lee's army had suffered some 20,000 casualties in that effort, he was embraced as a deliverer. Simultaneously, some 100 miles to the north, up in Washington City, Abraham Lincoln had to suffer McClellan's frustration. Bombarded by little Mac's incessant requests for reinforcements, the president decided to visit his commander down on the James at Harrison's Landing. On July 7th, the man who retreated from Richmond, who consistently and still believed himself outnumbered, now wanted to take the offensive. The president asked him how he would do so but found that McClellan, other than he wanted more troops, had no concrete plans. Four days after Lincoln's visit, and still harboring doubts about McClellan's command abilities, Lincoln acted. He named Major General Henry Halleck his new general-in-chief, a position that McClellan previously held. And on July 26th, he gave command of a newly created army in Virginia to an officer who had enjoyed success out in the Western Theater, Major General John Pope. Back in April of 1862, Pope, with naval assistance, had captured Island Number 10, which allowed federal navigation down the Mississippi to Tennessee. Mr. Lincoln wanted Pope to be a healer in the troubled Eastern Theater, but sadly, he was not. Tall, tall. Burley, and clearly anti-McClellan, he could be brash. Brigadier General Fitz John Porter, one of McClellan's corps commanders, had recently called Pope an ass. Brigadier General Samuel Sturgis was more colorful. I don't care for John Pope one pinch of owl dung. Undaunted, the new commander announced that he had come from out of the West, where his men had only seen the backs of their enemies. He announced his headquarters would be in the saddle. Confederate leadership commented, that was odd, that's where his hindquarters belonged. When Pope arrived in Virginia, he noted there was a great deal of Confederate guerrilla activity. To counter it, he stated that Virginia citizens would be held accountable for any raids or strikes. Stacked on top of another directive that his army would live off the land, an informed and incensed 52-year-old Robert E. Lee labeled John Pope a miscreant and emphatically stated he ought to be suppressed. Strong words for the man of iron control. For Pope, his newly created Army of Virginia was made up of units that earlier had been turned inside out by Stonewall Jackson during his Shenandoah campaign. Pope's First Corps was under German-American Major General Franz Siegel, and his second was commanded by the former Speaker of the House, Major General Nathaniel Banks. Both had been roughly handled in the valley by Jackson. 
Things did not improve with the head of Pope's Third Corps, for Major General Irvin McDowell seemed star-crossed. After his defeat at first Bull Run, his men believed him a jinx. Both Federal and Confederate armies ridiculed his distinctive hat a pith hat or helmet, which he wore to protect him from the sun. His own soldiers thought it a signal to the enemy, and Confederates simply thought, as one put it, that it looked like an inverted washbowl. So despised he was in the Federal ranks that when word spread that he was thrown from his mount, soldiers gave three cheers for the horse. Siegel Banks and McDowell did not inspire confidence, and that was exactly what Confederate authorities in Richmond had in Lee, who learned on July 12th that Banks' corps had been ordered to Gordonsville, Virginia, where the Orange and Alexandria Railroad intersected with the Virginia Central. Fully aware that McClellan's army was still down on the James at Harrison's Landing, Yet concerned about Banks' movements, Lee ordered Jackson to ascertain Federal intent. On July 27th, with still no sign of stirring by the Army of the Potomac, Lee ordered A.P. Hill's Light Division to join Jackson. The strategic chessboard sprang to life. Then on the 3rd of August, Lee learned that Major General Ambrose Burnside and his 14,000 men had been ordered to join Pope in central Virginia. The Confederate chieftain wanted Jackson to engage the Federal force before Burnside's arrival. On that same day, Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton disengaged one of their own. They pulled the plug on McClellan's desire to return to Richmond. They did so in part because he repeatedly reported he was outnumbered. With intel that Confederates were on the move, McClellan's paranoia seemed to spread to Washington City. Why keep two federal armies separated, Pope in central Virginia and McClellan down on the James, if Lee has overwhelming numbers? And so, Lincoln and Stanton wanted the two armies to unite, and to do so in central Virginia, not on the James, and certainly not under the command of George McClellan. The next day, the Army of the Potomac was ordered off the peninsula. When that information reached Lee, it gave him something no federal leader wanted him to have. Robert E. Lee now had the strategic initiative. Meanwhile, Stonewall Jackson continued to probe, and with units of Pope's army spread out over some 20 miles, an encounter was unavoidable. And it came around noon of August the 9th, at a place known as Cedar Mountain. There, Nathaniel Banks' 9,000 and Jackson's 24,000 collided. For most of that Saturday afternoon, they traded artillery fire. Then around 5 p.m., Banks, though outnumbered, ordered his men forward. Surprisingly, their attack overlapped Jackson's left and caved in three Confederate lines. Just as surprising, soon, too, Jackson's right was threatened as well. The situation so dire that Jackson himself rode forward into the fray. To rally his men, he reached to draw his sword, only to find the blade and scabbard so rusted he couldn't wield it. Instead, back he raced to the rear and found Major General A.P. Hill and Brigadier General Lawrence O'Brien Branch, who with his brigade of North Carolinians met, stemmed, and turned back Federal attacks. Their work saved Jackson from a very embarrassing setback. Banks withdrew around 6.30, and Jackson pursued but without effect. The scrap at Cedar Mountain was badly mismanaged by both Jackson and Banks. There were 2,377 Union casualties, 1,355 Confederate. So confused was the fight that both sides claimed victory. However, Banks' fight and losses seemed to take some of the sting and bluster out of John Pope's aggressiveness. Meanwhile, Lee received more intelligence. McClellan's army was not only leaving the peninsula, but his men were ordered to join Pope. A concern Lee now realized that Pope's force could possibly swell to some 130,000. He had to move.
He had to strike Pope before federal concentration. And so he ordered his other wing under James Longstreet to move. It was very risky, for by ordering Longstreet's men to march, Richmond would be defended by only some 25,000 men. Oh, the what might have beens. For that very same day, McClellan made one last plea to allow his army to return to Richmond. But Washington had had enough. Bring your army north and send units to Pope's Army of Virginia. In the central part of the Old Dominion, Pope's, at that moment, 62,000-man army was in an angle formed by the Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers. His lifeline for supply the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. In need of good fortune, he got some, interestingly enough, from Confederate cavalryman Jeb Stewart. After conferring with Lee on August the 18th, Stewart rode to a house near Verdiersville to rendezvous with one of his lieutenants. Leaving his cloak, sash, gloves, and plumed hat on the porch, Stewart went inside to sleep. The next morning, using the cover of an early morning mist, Union cavalry descended upon them. Stuart escaped, but his pride took a hit, for the Federals captured his gear, which included his plumed hat, and a haversack that contained Lee's plans to entrap Pope's force between the Rapidan and the Rappahannock. With this information, Pope moved north of the Rappahannock and out of immediate danger. Stuart was justifiably miffed by Pope's retreat, and Confederate infantry made it worse when they constantly inquired of him, Where's your hat? Angry and embarrassed, Stuart burned to get even, and it came August the 22nd in a raid at Catlett Station on the Orange in Alexandria. At dawn that day, 1,500 Confederates overran a Union cap. There, a captured African-American servant revealed that he knew the exact location of Pope's personal baggage train. To the Confederate cavalier seeking one upmanship, the opportunity was too tempting. Moving 60 miles in 26 hours, his men cut the telegraph line, descended on Catlett Station, and scattered the Federals. They not only captured $500,000 in greenbacks, 20000 in gold, 300 prisoners, official papers, and Pope's staff, but also Pope's dress uniform. In addition, they captured one federal captain who had wagered with a Confederate prisoner that he would be in Richmond within 30 days. He won the bet. He did enter Richmond within 30 days but as a prisoner of war. A plea Stewart took the raid and his acquisitions to another level. He sent a note to Pope that read, General, you have my hat and plume. I have your best coat. I have the honor to propose a cartel for a fair exchange of prisoners. There was more here than just showmanship. Captured papers informed Lee that McClellan's 3rd Corps had landed at Alexandria, Virginia, and Porter's 5th Corps had landed at Aquia Creek, and both were headed for Pope. Lee feared Pope's army would soon grow to 70,000. There is a military maxim, never divide your army in the face of superior numbers. Yet, that is exactly what Lee did. On the 24th of August, orders were sent to Stonewall to move his 24,000 westward and circle around Pope's force to the north. Anxious to make up for his dismal performance during the seven days and at Cedar Mountain, Jackson commented, I shall move within an hour. Longstreet's 30,000 were to hold Pope's army in place by demonstrating in front of him, then follow Jackson the next day. Lee hoped that his opponent, fearing encirclement, would retreat, and his reunited army would then fall upon an off-balanced federal force. However, by 8 a.m. of the next day, Pope was aware of the Confederate move, but he misread the intent. Pope believed Jackson, moving west, was headed for the Shenandoah Valley, but at Salem, Virginia, Jackson turned his army east and made his way to Thoroughfare Gap, which passed through the Bull Run Mountains. 
About mid-morning of the 26th, Stonewall Jackson turned toward Gainesville, Virginia, and then southeast to Bristow Station. His foot cavalry had covered 56 miles in two days, and it was now a full 20 miles in John Pope's rear. At Bristow Station, Brigadier General Isaac Trimble's 21st Georgia and 21st North Carolina were given a special task. Jackson ordered them to move four miles north to Manassas Junction, where they fell upon Pope's lightly guarded supply depot, one that covered nearly a square mile. Scattering a New Jersey brigade, the 221s, on the 27th of August wreaked havoc. Yet, as we all know, battle is fluid, and this fact was dramatically reinforced when one of Jackson's lieutenants, Major General Richard S. Ewell, reported a large federal force moving up from the south. It was Pope, and Jackson had to pull his force together and did so seven miles away at a place known as Stony Ridge. In doing so, each of Jackson's three divisions used three different routes. All this was reported to Pope. Stung with anger over the loss of his supplies and trains, and now dealing with reports of Confederate activity that seemed to be all over the countryside, he too wanted to unite his scattered units. In doing so, he was convinced that a worried Jackson would make a run west for the valley. Around 9 a.m. of Wednesday, August 27th, Pope ordered his army to unite at Manassas Junction. There, he was certain he would box in an isolated Jackson. So confident he crowed, we shall bag the whole crowd. His orders, however, had an unfortunate consequence. By concentrating at Manassas Junction, Pope essentially uncovered Thoroughfare Gap, the very route Lee and Longstreet planned to use to join Jackson. Now all the scattered routes that Jackson's divisions used came into play. Made aware on the 28th that A.P. Hill's Confederate force was spotted in Centerville, Pope issued new orders. His force would now gather at Centerville. As he issued these orders, 30,000 Confederates were headed for Thoroughfare Gap, and only one Union division, Brigadier James Ricketts, stood in their way. Only one Union division to stop five. Confederate numbers were simply too great. As Lee and Longstreet pushed their way through, Brigadier General Rufus King's Federal Division, that day under Brigadier General John Hatch because King was down after suffering an epileptic seizure, was stretched out in column along the Warrington Turnpike, and while searching for Jackson, marched right in front of Stonewall's men at Stony Point. They were probing for Jackson, but it was Jackson who found them. At about 6 p.m. on Thursday, August the 28th, just off to the left of the turnpike, a lone horseman appeared from the cover of the woods. It was none other than Jackson, and although he should have waited for the arrival of Longstreet's wing, he could not resist the sight of the enemy stretched out in column before him. Jackson slipped back into the woods and calmly ordered, "'Bring up your men, gentlemen.'" Amongst that unsuspecting Union division, there was a savvy veteran, Brigadier General John Gibbon, who commanded 2,100 men, all of them from the West, the 2nd, 6th, 7th Wisconsin, and the 19th Indiana, the famed Black Hat or Iron Brigade. Gibbon, appointed to West Point from, interestingly enough, North Carolina, had three brothers, two brothers-in-law, and a cousin who wore gray. Gibbon saw the lone horseman and watched him disappear. He also saw several columns of horsemen. He thought they might be roving cavalry, but then they did something that set off his military alarm. All began to swing left in unison. Instantaneously, he recognized the maneuver of swinging guns into battery. There, in front of John Brawner's farm, Gibbon's Iron Brigade was about to be hit by six brigades of Jackson's veterans. The Battle of Brawner's Farm, or Groveton, the first chapter in the Battle of Second Manassas, began. 
Gibbon shook his men out of column and put them into battle formation. Up a gentle slope they went shoulder to shoulder, and then from out of the woods some seventy-five yards away a Confederate volley. And so began one of the sharpest stand-up fights of the war. Neither side truly advanced nor retreated. More troops did join in, and they poured lead into one another until it was too dark to continue. The fight did reveal Jackson's position. A long stony ridge and an unfinished railroad cut that provided cover. When night ended the fight, there were about 1,300 casualties for each side. Then came an unusual development. Though Jackson had revealed his position, Pope's orders were orders. King or Hatch's men had been ordered to join Pope's main body, and so they marched on through Manassas Junction and to Centerville. Now another curious instance, and one that would create federal despair in the coming days. When Ricketts retreated from Thoroughfare Gap, incredibly, he did not alert his commanding general of Lee and Longstreet's passage through Thoroughfare Gap. That evening, Pope tried to assimilate everything going on around him. He wanted to crush Jackson's isolated wing between Porter's V Corps, who had come up from McClellan's army, and his own III Corps under McDowell. The problem was locating McDowell to get him where he wanted him. And that frustration prompted Pope to spit out, God damn McDowell, he's never where I want him. As the sun rose on Friday the 29th of August, Union troops who were nearest Jackson made piecemeal attacks against the left of his one and two-thirds mile long line. All the while, and unbeknownst to Pope, Longstreet's wing began to arrive on the field at about 10.30 in the morning and fell in on Jackson's right. By noon, the divided wings of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia were reunited and were in a defensive line some four miles in length, and on high ground, perfectly positioned between the two infantry wings, four batteries of artillery. Around 1 p.m., Pope himself arrived on the old Bull Run battlefield, and did so completely unaware that Longstreet and some 30,000 men set completely astride his exposed left flank. That should have become obvious when he ordered Major General Fitz John Porter to strike Jackson's right, and his 5th Corps commander reported he could not because a large body of Confederates blocked his way. Porter decided to wait until he had more information about who and what was in front of him. Around 2.30, while impatiently waiting for Porter to attack, Pope ordered Brigadier General John Reynolds and his Pennsylvania Reserves to move forward. They, too, reported they could not due to a large Confederate presence. Yet Pope's mind was fixated on destroying Jackson. And so throughout the afternoon of that Friday the 29th, he threw unsupported attack after attack at men in butternut and gray who were hunkered down in and around an unfinished railroad cut. Each one, Pope hoped, would draw Jackson's attention from the attack he hoped to be his biggest, that of Porter's. At about 3 p.m., a federal brigade under Brigadier General Cuvier Grover went in. It found a gap in Jackson's line, but timely reinforcements threw it back. Around 4, Colonel James Nagel's brigade, the 2nd Maryland, 6th New Hampshire, and 48th Pennsylvania, attacked Jackson's center and like Grover made some headway, but unsupported were also repulsed. Around five or six, Pope repeated his order for Porter to attack, and this time there was no room for discretion or discussion. He wanted Porter's fifth to move immediately. It is interesting to note that right then and there, both Pope and Lee were frustrated. Pope couldn't get Porter to attack, and Lee, hoping to ease pressure on Jackson's front, couldn't get Longstreet to budge. And pressure on Jackson's front, as the afternoon wore on, increased dramatically when his far left became the target of intense attacks led by the fiery Major General Philip Kearney, who roared to his men, Fall in here, you sons of bitches, and I'll make Major Generals out of every one of you. 
They struck around 6 p.m., and his attack drove Confederates out of their protected position in the railroad cut. To counter, Brigadier General Maxie Gregg, South Carolinians and Branches, North Carolinians, moved to plug the gap. Both fought fiercely and bought time for Jackson to shift reinforcements from his right under Brigadier General Jubal Early to his threatened left. The Confederate counterattack finally drove Kearney's Federals back in fighting that had been desperate. Evidence of that surfaced when Branch later learned that his entire brigade of North Carolinians had amongst them only 24 cartridges. Throughout the afternoon of the 29th, Pope, unaware of Longstreet's presence, threw piecemeal attack after attack in an effort to destroy Stonewall Jackson. Each had some success, but without support, all were thrown back. Now, very late in the day, there was one more card to play. In the rear, Pope received word that Kearney had effected a breakthrough. Though in truth it was a temporary one, Pope believed he had the moment he had hoped for all day. Certain he was on the cusp of victory, he ordered Brigadier General John Hatch's brigade to pursue. So Hatch drove his New Yorkers west along the Warrenton Turnpike until they ran headlong into a group of Confederates. It was part of Longstreet's wing, and they weren't going anywhere. It was John Bell Hood's Texas Brigade. They collided around 7 p.m., and in 30 minutes, Hatch's pursuit became retreat. An hour later, darkness ended the day's fighting. That night, both armies shifted lines and orders were distributed for the next day. As the sun rose on August the 30th, the battered and weary men under Jackson, men who had weathered so many Union attacks the day before, wondered if and when Longstreet would throw in his considerable weight. In truth, so did Lee. Expecting renewed federal attacks, some of Jackson's men went to the rear to replenish ammunition. Enough did so that reports reached John Pope that Jackson was leaving the field. Once more, Pope issued orders for Porter's 5th and essentially his entire army to move north of the Warrington Turnpike and drive what he believed was a retreating from the field Jackson. Porter, the man whom Pope firmly believed was trying to undo him, complied but by doing so left Brigadier General John Reynolds' single division in front of Longstreet's 30,000 men. Both Porter and First Corps Commander Franz Siegel warned Pope of a great Confederate presence to the West, yet he believed that in Porter's case it was nothing more than an excuse to do nothing. Pope wanted pursuit. And in issuing orders to do just that, it was Reynolds who around 1.30 p.m. came face to face with the ominous reality. Fully aware of impending disaster, he mounted up, rode for about a mile, raced to Pope and blurted, General Pope, the enemy is turning our left. Clouded, confused, and suspicious, John Pope answered, Oh, I guess not. Instead of what had to be incredulous, John Reynolds was ordered to join Porter's force in pursuit of the supposedly retreating Jackson. When he did, some 12 cannon and 2,200 men, about a 1,000 of them in the 5th and 10th New York, were now left in front of Longstreet's bubbling volcano. Around 3 p.m., Porter's 5th went in and found that Jackson had not gone anywhere. Porter's 5th hit Jackson's right. Exhausted and low on ammunition, they were just hanging on, but Lee fully expected Jackson to live up to his nickname, Stonewall. In fact, Lee waited for Porter's advance. He waited for Porter to fully expose his left flank. Tactically, it made sense. Yet within Jackson's line, the wait must have seemed eternal, for Porter's attack had weight to it. And a few of Jackson's men, like Brigadier General William Stark's Louisianans, were so short of ammunition they literally resorted to throwing rocks. Adding their leaden weight, Confederate artillery placed on high ground between Jackson and Longstreet's wings helped blow Porter's attack apart. And then, finally, finally, 
around 4 p.m. Longstreet, whose vanguard arrived on the battlefield at 10.30 a.m. the day before, signaled he was ready. What happened next was cataclysmic. A wave of butternut and gray, one and a half miles long, advanced over Chin Ridge and smashed John Pope's exposed left. It would be the largest simultaneous mass counterattack of the war. Confederate bullets were so thick that one participant remembered it sounded like an immense flock of partridges. Union men were cut down in droves. Young's branch ran red, Federal bodies damming up the creek. The 5th New York was shot to pieces. In the first two minutes, it lost probably 100 men. Not only were they shot down, they were riddled. Wearing the distinctive red and blues of the French-Algerian-influenced Zouave uniform, the fallen bodies of the 5th and 10th New York reminded one Texan of his state's countryside when wildflowers were in bloom. After 10 awful minutes, the 5th New York had nearly 300 men down, 120 mortally. For a single infantry regiment, it was the largest loss of life in any single battle of the entire Civil War. Some 560 men cut down to 60. Yet though the gray wave washed over everything in its path, the Federals caught a break. The entire Confederate front did not move as one. Jackson's men, in large part because they had borne the brunt of countless attacks for the better part of the last two days, did not move forward until about six and so, during that two-hour lull, some seven to 8,000 Federals were shifted from Jackson's front to Longstreet's. Colonel Nathaniel C. McLean's Ohioans and Brigadier General Zealous B. Towers' mixed brigade of Pennsylvanians and New Yorkers bought time for Pope to realign. Still, though, by the time Jackson's men joined the attack, Longstreet's wing had driven five of six Union brigades. Pope's lifeline was the Warrington Turnpike, and if Longstreet's men could get across the Manassas Sudley Church Road and overrun Henry House Hill, yes, the same hill that was the cockpit of action a little over a year earlier, Pope's line of retreat would be cut off. The deep cut of the Manassas Sudley Church Road aided federal defense, which was manfully provided by two brigades in particular. Tough, well-trained U.S. regulars under Lieutenant Colonel William Chapman and Reynolds, Pennsylvania Reserves. Longstreet surge reached that thoroughfare about 5.30 in the afternoon, but by then it did not have the offensive weight to drive across to Henry House Hill. And yet, the damage was done. Around 8 p.m., a light rain began to fall. Amidst fatigue and darkness, Pope chose to withdraw. Once again, on the plains of Manassas, Confederate forces had been victorious, and with Lee's army in control of the battlefield, many Union wounded and their surgeons were left behind. One unnamed Union soldier wrote of the following circumstance. There were six of us, and we six had had seven legs amputated. Our condition was horrible in the extreme. Several of us were as innocent of clothing as the hour we were born. Between our mangled bodies and the rough surface of the board floor, there was a thin rubber blanket. To cover our nakedness, another blanket. Between us and the fierce heat of that Virginia sun, there was but only the poor protection of a thin tent cloth. Back in Centerville, John Pope sat in a chair against a wall, hands laced behind his head. His eyes stared blankly straight ahead, focused on no one, focused on nothing. Similarly, at Second Manassas, he saw only through his eyes, never through his opponents. He had come from out of the West and found that Lee, Longstreet, and Jackson were nothing like the Confederate officers he had faced along the Mississippi. Two days later, on the 1st of September, Stonewall Jackson gave pursuit and at Ox Hill or Chantilly, there was another fight. It was a nasty one and was fought under black skies where thunder and lightning accompanied the crash of shot and shell. It was there that two federal officers of note were killed. 
Colonel Fletcher Webster of the 12th Massachusetts, eldest son of Daniel Webster, and one of the finest officers the North possessed, Philip Kearney. The three days of fighting at Brawner's Farm, the Warrington Turnpike, the railroad cut, Chin Ridge, claimed over 20,000 total casualties, 8,350 Confederates in victory, and over 13,800 Federals in defeat. Strategically, the Confederate victory was significant. In the first days of May 1862, George McClellan, as we have noted, and his army were only some three miles outside of Richmond. Now, three months later, Robert E. Lee and his army were only some 20 miles outside the gates of Washington City. Second Manassas cleared the strategic table in Virginia like no other. It trumpeted a Confederate command chemistry that at the time the North could only dream about. Highlighted Stonewall Jackson's ability to create opportunity. Yes, James Longstreet was cautious, but no one threw a mightier counterpunch. And Robert E. Lee, the architect, guided and masterminded it all. Second Manassas may well have served as perhaps the conflict's best example of the happy marriage between strategy and tactics. Yet the victory cost the Confederates over 8,300 casualties. Lee's men had campaigned hard, and yes, they had won, and morale was high. But supplies were needed, legs ached, and stomachs were empty. Across the way, Second Manassas undid John Pope. As John J. Hennessy noted in his 1993 work, Return to Bull Run, Pope, after the battle, swung wildly from fits of depression to burst of combative optimism. To explain defeat, he searched for scapegoats, but in the end, it was he, and he alone, that was responsible for the condition and circumstance of his army. In thrashing about trying to locate Jackson, he ran his cavalry to collapse and made it impossible for his army to be fed and provisioned for more than a week. He allowed Jackson to completely outmaneuver him, and when full battle came, he mounted nothing but disjointed, bloody, unsupported attacks. On August the 30th, he allowed Longstreet to threaten and eventually destroy his left. Yet, for all the faults... There was one positive. John Pope did get his army away, essentially intact after the battle. True, it was not destroyed, but it was yet another federal reverse, and the ripples of defeat affected many. You see, defeat breeds mistrust, and that ran rampant up and down the channels of the federal high command. Within days, Pope targeted Fitz John Porter, a McClellan man. He had him court-martialed for refusal to obey orders at 2nd Manassas. Porter was dismissed from the Army January the 21st, 1863, and spent the rest of his days trying to clear his record. As for John Pope, after only 74 days in command, he was reassigned to the Department of the Northwest, where he was ordered to Minnesota, to put down the bloody Sioux Uprising of 1862. In Washington City, all the turmoil created a sordid whirl of who could be trusted. In back rooms and in hushed voices, the poisonous word treason was leveled at men in high command. As the defeated Army of Virginia and elements of the Army of the Potomac marched back to the gates of Washington, Union morale was as low as Confederate was high. And so the story goes. The line of Union retreat brought them in on the Fairfax Road on the afternoon of September the 2nd. The rain was gone. The sun had returned. And enough warmth and drying out that the long serpent-like line of men in blue marched in a cloud of swirling dust. Pope and Irvin McDowell rode ahead, side by side. Among them and their staffs, a brief interval. Then came John Hatch, his men, the ones that initiated the fight back at Brawner's farm. Like almost all, they stared blankly into the backs of the man in front. 
one foot shuffling mindlessly in front of the other. And then out in the road ahead, a little group of horsemen appeared. In the backdrop of defeat and despair, they rode confidently. The man in front on a great black horse and adorned with a bright yellow sash about his waist, erect and dapper in the saddle. As he rode up to Generals Pope and McDowell, he snapped a salute to them. That was all John Hatch needed to see. There was only one man who saluted like that, and Hatch spurred his horse to the scene. He got there just in time to hear that by order of the President of the United States, the man on the black horse was assuming command of all the troops. It was George Brenton McClellan. Hatch smiled. He had a score to settle with John Pope, whom he hated. Pope, when he first came east, dressed him down for failure to complete missions that he, Pope, helped to scuttle. Hatch now saw his chance to get even. He trotted back a few paces from the three officers, and in a loud voice, easily heard by both McDowell and Pope, shouted, Boys, McClellan is in command of the army again. Three cheers! There was a brief stunned silence, and then a wild yell went up. Hats, caps, and knapsacks were thrown into the air, and the roar cascaded all the way down the long blue line. It was a delirious joy, and it roared unabated, a moment soldiers remembered for the rest of their lives. Little Mac was back. He would have yet another chance to, as he put it a year earlier, to save the Union. And indeed, the Union needed saving, for Lee had cleared Virginia and driven the enemy within the defenses of Washington City. Out in the West, Confederate General Edmund Kirby Smith threatened Frankfort, Kentucky, and Braxton Bragg's Confederate Army of Tennessee was moving north toward Kentucky. Louisville and Cincinnati were under martial law. On September the 4th, as burial details cleared the landscape at Manassas and Ox Hill, the vanguard of Lee's Army of Northern Virginia splashed north across the Potomac River, singing, O oh Maryland, my Maryland. On a 1,000-mile front, the Confederacy was pushing the issue for its independence. A Richmond paper captured the moment when it noted, Mighty events, mightier than any that have yet occurred, are evidently on the wing. For Robert E. Lee and George B. McClellan and their men, those mighty events carried them 13 days later to a small town in western Maryland, a ripening corn, verdant rolling fields and pastures belied a nation at war with itself. That tranquil landscape dissected by a picturesque stream, a body of water known as Antietam Creek. When next we gather, daring adventures removed from the clash of full-scale battle. We'll detail the exploits of those who operated in the shadows and behind enemy lines. Men and women who schemed independently to scoop, seize, disrupt, or destroy. I hope you'll join us when we share the stories of spies, scouts, and raiders. This is Fred Kiger. Thank you for listening.